Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. While the concept of education so far this year has been a rallying cry during the General Assembly's sessions in the Carolinas, that is by far not the only issue being contended with. Welcome again to the most widely watched and the longest running source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William. Thank you for supporting this broadcast. In a moment, we start the dialogue. Pat Kale and Peggy McLean join us, two respected economic developers and leaders in the region. And later on, Prisma may be a new name, but it's a product of two older, well-known systems. Our guest, Mike Reardon, formerly of Greenville Health, joins us to talk about the health care position of Greenville Palmetto Health merger. We'll start that in a moment. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Peggy B. McLean from Kershaw County Economic Development, Pat Kale of the Union County Chamber, and special guest Mike Rear, co-CEO of Prisma Health. Welcome to our program, Pat. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Pe Peggy, welcome. Good to have you here as well. You know, let's start with this idea that the General Assembly is in session. South Carolina's got a short session. North Carolina's have longer mm -hmm. will probably be a good balance of the year. Do you get the sense, I know, I know education is being spelled out as job one. We're going to get some things done here. You get the sense that that will be the case in South Carolina. I think so, um, simply because the leaders or the people talking about it are the ones that need to be talking about it. Um, the leadership. You mean outside of the state house as well? No, I'm think I'm really talking about the state house. Um, you know, um, Lucas is really focused on it. The governor is focused on it, and so uh, I know the Senate members are, know the importance of it, and certainly those of us outside the state house are talking about it and saying, okay, let's do something. Let's make this work. Okay, all right. What do you think, Pat? Same thing in North Carolina? I do. They're talking about some very important issues that really haven't been in discussion in a while. Certainly teacher pay always yeah. comes up and that's been an ongoing conversation. But things about capital improvements, there's been a lot of conversation there. So I am hopeful. You know, we have a couple of representatives in Union County, Craig Horn, who's a co-chair, who's very focused on this. So my hope is that, that there will be some real real changes made, some real investments made in education. I, th I think it's a real focus for them. You know, the other thing that's been kind of couched behind um, uh, education and some reform has been talked about is this idea of transportation, transportation funding. And I know specifically we had uh, not long ago, Christy Hall from DOT in mm -hmm. South Carolina was thrilled that South Carolina came through with increasing the gas tax now. And I know it's been a couple yes. of years, but that seems to be at the right time. And I'm gonna give you a chance to talk about transportation because that's an issue in Union County as well. Uh, Peggy, you see a, there's a lot of construction going on in the major arteries around Columbia, certainly Charleston, mm -hmm. the upstate of South Carolina. Is it enough? Is it happen happening quickly <laughs> enough? Uh, well, is it being deployed appropriately, I guess? Well, I mean, I can't gauge as to is it being deployed appropriately. <laughs> and it is never fast enough, and it is never enough. I mean, because we're always going to lag behind in infrastructure improvements, um, and especially roads. There's more and more people on the highway. Commerce is up, and so trucks are going to be up. You know, we're doing things in South Carolina, such as the inland ports. Um, those are there to alleviate some of the bottlenecks of the Charleston port area because the volume of the port is going up. You've talked with Jim Newsom, you know what's going on. So the southeast more and more and more and faster, faster, faster. Is it, it, it and I'm sorry, I didn't want to keep short circuiting yeah. you here. Is, is, it, um, is it keeping business from happening 
Oh, I don't. I don't think so. You don't get that sense. No, I mean Volvo okay. would not have gone into Charleston if, if uh, they didn't think that the transportation system could work. Boeing is, to, you know, because of course you're in a port city, so some of your transportation um, routes are limited because you can't go in the ocean. Right. So you know, um, I don't think it's it's um, hurting my ability to recruit new industry to Kershaw County. Not at all. In the last 60 days, Pat, um, in Union County, North mm -hmm. Carolina, just that borders South Carolina, interestingly enough, the Monroe Expressway opened after, yes. as you said, I think probably 30 years of debate around this. Absolutely, finally. it was 30 years. This chamber has worked for at least <laughs> almost 25 to 30 years on bringing this expressway, along with elected officials and others, of course, but bringing this expressway to life. So November is that we How opened. That? First road, first time I traveled on it was that day. That so day. it's good and it's bad. So now mm -hmm. you're directing some commercial traffic mm -hmm. around the center of Monroe, North Carolina, and around the, out, the, out, the outer edges of Union County. Is that good? Is that bad? How do residents feel now about Monroe that they've got this I'll call it a bypass, but it's an expressway. That's a great question, and I think it, um, when the expressway was being discussed, of course there were two camps, those who mm -hmm. were just really for it, and the chamber was one of those, and then those who said we don't need it. And now that it's a reality, there are those, you know, we've, we have uh, certain folks, I think, who still say, oh, I can't believe we have to pay a toll in today's environment. Um, and those who say, I really don't think this is necessary. But I think for those of us who are in, uh, related to business, see that it is a, it's very much necessary and brings some opportunity in a couple of ways. One is if you live in Union County, especially if you live in Monroe, you do not travel on Business 74 because everyone else is traveling on 74. And over the past, what, 10, 15 years, that road has become so busy, not just during the summer when you all are going to the beach or to Wilmington, but also uh, every day mm -hmm. is now bumper mm -hmm. to bumper. So the advantage for uh, businesses on 74 is I think it will reopen 74 to those of us who live and work there to do business there and then hopefully move transient traffic more to the expressway. There is concern, I know I've, I've talked with some business owners who've said, I'm concerned I'm going to lose uh, business from those who travel through, but the reality of it, and you probably know this too, Peggy, in your area, is if someone is traveling through, they're doing gas, fast mm -hmm. food, right, and maybe the occasional hotel, they're not stopping to shop in Monroe if they're heading to Wilmington to go to the beach. So I think from that advantage, that's one opportunity. The other is it now opens up a part of our community. You know Union County's two counties in one. The western side very uh, heavily residentially developed and then the eastern side more ag, more industry. Mm -hmm. And so it now opens up an opportunity for our economic developer to go out and bring in logistics and some things that we haven't had because we don't have a major um, interstate, interstate in Union County. So that brings access. The biggest question about that is how are our land use ordinances mm. going to interact with that? We've got yeah. to be smart about how we develop the land around this and there are six government entities that are affected by this expressway. You know, we have 14 municipalities in Union County and of course our, our county government. So how they work together and how they uh, decide on what we will do with this land is very important to the future. Which brings up another good point. Mm -hmm. Union County, Kershaw County, both a but, but are not, not rural, not urban. You are both close to major metros, mm -hmm. but you're not in the country, but you're not in those. So how, do, how does, you know, as you hear Pat talking about it, Peggy, what goes through your mind about Kershaw County and the development of and the future of, et cetera, et cetera? Well, and, and I think you put it very well. We're not rural, um, we're not metro, uh, but that's what I sell and what is attractive about our community. When I'm talking with prospective industries looking, I say you can have whatever you want, so you have choice. So you can live on a farm if you want to, or you can live in downtown Columbia and work in Kershaw County um, within you know, 30 minutes. And it, you know, that's a low commute time. So really and truly, it's, it's the best of both worlds. Does that work when you make that argument? Certainly, I yeah. mean, the number of employees, when you look at where your um, labor draw is, that's one of the great things about Kershaw County is that we've got a very, very strong labor draw. You know, over a million people within 60 minutes of drive time. 
and that is very attractive to companies. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring our guests on here in just a second, but ladies, please stay with us because I'm sure there'll be more of this coming up on this program. Uh, the newly minted chief executive officer of one of the largest corporations in the Carolinas, certainly one of the Fortune 500 companies, that's Sunoco, has hired uh, or has promoted Rob Teed to the C-suite. He will be a guest on this program, and also coming up, John McConnell has uh, done quite the job stringing together not just golf courses, but building McConnell Golf. What does that mean? How has he standardized that business? Uh, John McConnell coming up also on this show. The ongoing debate in healthcare policy only increases uncertainty around any type of long-term healthcare planning. And that is, as a hospital, how do you plan as an administrator, as an insurer, as a patient? What is going to happen and where is it going to go? That is the big question or one of the big questions. Well, that hasn't stopped healthcare providers from strategically moving ahead. One of the latest large tie-ups includes Greenville Health in the upstate and Midlands-based Palmetto Health. Joining us now uh, and now us in again is the co-chief executive officer of Prisma Health, Mike Reardon. Mike, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Nice to see you. Wow. So, um, Mike, was this merger, and I apologize for the, maybe the hyperbole here, but yeah. was this merger about surviving? Well, well yes and, and no. <laughs> uh, so, uh, of course, I mean, there's always a defensive move uh, around that. You look at some of the big systems in South Carolina and North Carolina. You know, how do we sort of look at our market? Uh, and then where do we think health care is going? But the big reason was uh, we looked very candidly and objectively at what's the health status of South Carolina. We're, we're in the bottom quartile nationally. Uh, and that is how we, we, if you look at any health statistic, that's where we are. And we said, this is where we are with two separate systems. What if we came together and is there a bigger idea where we could then elevate the health status of South Carolina as we came together? So, of course, there was a defensive move to some of this, but it was really about the health status of South Carolina, improving the health for South Carolina. So can you point to that? I know you make the argument because yes. you just said it. Will you be? Do you feel very confident five years from now you can point to that to say that was the region that was the biggest region for this merger and here's what's happened? Yes, and in fact that's the that's how we focus even our board meetings. What are those issues? Whether it's around uh, infant mortality, uh, obesity, in incidence of other cardiovascular diseases. What's the structure we're putting in place now so that in five years we can say we had a bet? It was a big idea and it's paying off. You don't just come together and it just flips right away, but that's exactly what I think my successor or our successor will be able to do uh, on mm -hmm. this show. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that um, in our community we're, we're working with is telemedicine or sure. teleconnectivity. Right. And so certainly telemedicine um, is something I'm sure you're looking at. Would love to hear kind of where where your thoughts are on on that because we're looking at it from an education standpoint. Right. Our kids are getting you know e e classrooms. So how is telemedicine working? Yeah. So even South Carolina as a state has made that uh, decision and said let's put resources into that. So uh, along with the. Uh, Medical University of South Carolina, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, old Greenville and Palmetto, now Prisma Health. What are the ways to sort of put that in there? And the reason to do that is there is a shortage of providers. Uh, okay. uh, so if you look at a behavioral health or if you look at something else where you don't have a lot of providers, and especially in some of the smaller rural communities, how can you get access to that mm -hmm. uh, so that there could be uh, real-time consults uh, in those communities uh, because you're not going to have the physician or the nursing or the, the, uh, the, the medical care giver uh, available there uh, to do that. So yes, that is happening, it's being deployed uh, within our system and, and even with our own employees and you're seeing that at a national level as well. Are y'all participating in helping the network to be expanded or is that really the community that needs to put in the infrastructure? Yes, needed? so so that would be us sort of leading the way in, in how we put those resources uh, into those communities, so into the smaller emergency room for example, mm -hmm. so that there can uh, be that consult, into the the if there's a premature baby born, how can you get that NICU uh, or that professional neonatologist engaged mm -hmm. right away? So yeah, this this is very much to our 
uh, interest. And back to sort of Chris's point, when you look at health status of the of the state mm -hmm. and of the states, it's that type of uh, intervention that will help us because the workforce development activities that are going on are not going to be producing enough caregivers uh, to be distributed in, in these. And we still have to figure out ways to do that, but mm -hmm. tele telemedicine is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. One of the questions I have go, yeah. goes around that workforce development piece. In our own community, Atrium Health is facing some of those same issues, right. and they've actually partnered with our school system to develop a health sciences academy yes. at the middle school level, and that will be moving into the high school level. And I know you're right in the middle of a merger. Former banker, yeah. I know yeah. about mergers, <laughs> yes. not to the size yeah. you do. but. What does that look like for you all in the future, workforce development? How will yeah. you face that? Uh, so I love what, what Atrium's doing, and I love how we've approached it uh, as well. The pipeline starts uh, really early. early. So we have mm -hmm. what we call our Medical Experience Academy uh, in the upstate, uh, but it is to exactly uh, to create that pipeline. We were in the upstate one of the, uh, in the last, uh, what, 2011, 2012, we started our own uh, medical school, uh, and that was with the University of South Carolina. It was a purely a workforce development play because we looked at the number of physicians in this state and they were exiting. We, kn we needed a, a grow your own strategy. Uh, we recently did the same model with Clemson on a nursing school. So right now on our campus, we have a Clemson a nursing school, uh, uh, a University of South Carolina medical school <laughs> connected. Awesome. We think it's the only two buildings that they have connected <laughs> uh, in the whole state That's wonderful. Uh, working That's together. Fun. But it was really a workforce development based on shortages. And we think if we can integrate those clinicians into the environment early, we also reduce the training that they need to come right. on board. It's really kind of, we've learned this from the technical schools. The technical schools have mm -hmm. known this for, yeah. for decades. Uh, so it's really stealing from that model. So as you tie up, as you figure out what the new Prisma looks like, yeah. and you've got now MUSC yeah. has also gotten more aggressive after yes. sitting on their hands, that's <laughs> my term, sitting on their hands for a while. Community Health Systems is now gonna be part of that. You've got Atrium, you've got Novant, you've got yep. Cone. Yes. Are we going to end up with four or five yeah. uber large providers of health in the Carolinas? Is yes. that what it's gonna look like? Uh, I actually think we're, we're going to, that is gonna be the case. And, but it, across both Carolinas, it'd be more than four or five, it'd be eight to 10, but it'll be larger systems. Uh, and, and you have to look at, they're doing that back to our earlier question, part survival, but part to, uh, to, to move forward and executing uh, their strategy. I, so I do think that's gonna and, and let me peel back this one thing, and, I, and it's not meant to be good or bad, but yeah. you know the fact that Chuck Beeman from Palmetto Health, yes. Mike Reardon from Greenville yes. Health have agreed to be co-CEO right. until a new CEO is found, yeah is fairly rare when you have tie-ups. Usually you have an agreement that one is going to be chair or vice chair and CEO and they'll be, and they'll sure. reset the, the, the sunset provisions of whatever that is. But you and Chuck have decided we're gonna find a replacement to replace both of us and start the day anew. Is that fair to That's say? That's right. I mean, part of coming, these things take a um, lot of time to pull together. One of the early principles was that neither of us would succeed either of us. And a lot of that was just to uh, avoid the perception that one area, when one community wins over another, there's real sensitivity. That's been a big learning for me, an appropriate sensitivity. There's so much pride in our individual communities that we want to come together but not send a signal that one system won, one system lost. So we both had to sort of take a deep breath and realize that neither of us were gonna do that. So we're, we are actually in the middle uh, of that uh, CEO uh, search and, and hope to have uh, by the summer or, or fall uh, an announcement around that. So you're a free agent this fall, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so don't tell my kids. <laughs> Peggy? Um, you know, I deal with industries and recruiting yeah. industries, yeah. and healthcare is one of the questions I ask. Um, and so when you've got these large, right. you know, companies, what would be the message you would want us to give prospective industries as they come into South Carolina? Yeah, so I got a, a real interesting glimpse of that because one of the tasks we had to do was uh, be t even between um, uh, the Midlands and the upstate, where were we gonna put our executive home mm -hmm. office? And to really get a sense of how important this is to the local leaders. And so for us it was to say, we may choose a, an office, but there is gonna be strong local presence 
uh, in okay. both communities because that's what the local businesses need. To, that's where the relationships mm -hmm. are, et cetera. So in the Midlands, strong still uh, connections there and as well as in the upstate. But we think it, there's a symbiotic relationship here, what I have uh, have said. Uh, the biggest driver for health care status or health status that we're trying to prove, improve is actually economic development. The better mm -hmm. economic development, better jobs, better neighborhoods, better mm -hmm. nutrition, better education, and in an odd way that helps us. So anything we can do to partner on the economic development side, if, if we know a company's coming in, we are all in because that will help us. We've been able to tie to our mission yes. uh, of improving uh, health. It's really mm -hmm. a big yeah. deal and important. So. And, and along those same lines, I read a report not, not too long ago about um, where we are in the status of health care as, as far as being healthy in the South. Right. And we don't look so good. And <laughs> yeah. I think part of it may be because of our lifestyles, our yes. eating and so forth. So how, when I think about a large systems as yes. we're talking about in rural communities especially, what it, how, how are you impacting that in your system? Yeah, so what does that look like going forward? This is what gets me excited. And this is when I was, uh, earlier said, we looked at those same metrics that you're referring to yeah. and we are towards the bottom and said, what can we do differently? Uh, we're really good if you're really sick, but how can we get out proactively with the school systems, with the businesses, mm -hmm. and start measuring these things in a different way and then putting our resources there? So if a board will tell a, a leadership team where we need to go and, and we work together and incentives are put around that, that's the direction uh, that will head. So I, I think uh, that, for me, is the big motivating factor of improving the health status of South Carolina. You know, it's interesting. Is you did you have a follow up? I was it's just okay going to say, and uh, along those lines too, thinking about large health issues that we're having now, opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, yes. and Good mental point. health, and others. Can a system like yours impact that when you're talking about a rural county? What does that look like? Yes, and and you know, we, I talk about. Uh, I mentioned USC and Clemson before. Yeah. There's this other university uh, in the upstate, Furman. Uh, so we're looking at, and we've, we've uh, an institute uh, for community, um, for advancement of community health, IACE, we call it. It's how do you put resources into a local community that identifies, um, you know, maybe if there is opioid or there are a lot of uh, emergency room uh, visits, how can you proactively get the community and community health providers into those uh, homes and areas so that it reduces people coming to our uh, emergency room. So there's, an, there's also an academic or a, a university uh, play here, mm -hmm. and, and that's how we're, we're gonna continue to reach into those uh, communities. Yeah. And we have, we have systems, we have smaller hospitals in rural communities that are gonna be actively uh, involved in that. You know, it's interesting, is, as, you, as you talk about the strategy and the tactics of what what Prisma looks like, yeah. but also the healthcare in the region looks like. You, you, you've never once referred, at least in this dialogue, to national healthcare policy. Yeah. So, has the uncertainty around whatever national healthcare policy looks like doesn't not matter? I don't mean that, but does it really impact anymore because it's been so uncertain for so long? Yeah. So, I, I think <laughs> what. Uh, I think I, w I would like predictability. What's what's <laughs> difficult is the variation. So if, if we're going to, as a nation, move towards the Affordable Care Act, but then we're going to move back. All of these regulations and shifts in tone and, and policy really do have a, a big impact. And but I don't see that changing. I I think it's been a part of the top two or three debate issues. Uh, uh, for the last mm -hmm. 12 years, and it'll be, it's already gearing up to be a top issue. So, and we've got really smart folks who are gonna figure this out, but it is, it does make it difficult. You know, both of our states, North and South, have not expanded Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that will happen at some point. Is it inevitable? Um, oh gosh, uh, th th that's up to <laughs> that's them. Uh, I think, uh, just stepping back, if the conversation at a national level keeps up at the, and it's uh, one, two, three, uh, top topic for voters over the next, then something is inevitable because what the voters are saying is something's not working well, whether it's expansion is the answer or not, or Medicare for all is the answer or not, I don't know. 
And me personally, I think it's inevitable. Is it, we've got about a minute left. So my term, this is going to be my term, yeah. and I think you'll understand how this works, Mike. So you and your colleagues yes. uh, administrate tours at providers. Is it a bit like whistling past the graveyard when we're talking about health care policy that could inflict a mortal wound on any one hospital at any one time if they change policy? Well, on and we're, we're seeing some of that, if I'm hearing your question right. That is happening. We've seen some of the rural hospitals have to readjust or shut down. Yeah. Um, uh, at, at a macro level, I think we figure it out. Uh, whether South Carolina or North Carolina expands or don't, we'll, we'll figure it out. But there are growing pains uh, that will be associated uh, with that. Yeah. But we, we'll, we'll figure. I'm always an optimist. We'll I, you out. know, I've always known that about you, and, and you haven't let us down yet. Yeah. So thank you for being thank you for being here. Yeah. Good right. job. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pat. Good to see you on the program. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. If I, I love Monroe, but I'm probably going to take that expressway. In my <laughs> I don't trip. blame yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. And, and good to see you, Peggy. Thank nice you. to be here. Thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Hope your weekend is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by Bearings, Grant Thornton, Colonial Life, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.